on to the next topic then, which is on adsorption. There's your activated carbon. You can pass it around. Um, so you've all seen that. How many of you have cats or parents have cats or family members? Kind of get this new cat litter that's silica gel. Okay, or those little white bags that you open in electronics. That's an adsorbent. It's a very cheap one. So those little white bags in electro electronics are used to absorb the humidity during transportation. So there's, a, there's one. Anything else we know about adsorbents? Like little white packets that you get in, like you buy a television or there's little white bags of adsorbents. Oh. Yeah, it's just too hot. Okay, anything else? Yeah, Paul. The porosity of the adsorbent is important, so that's related to surface area. So if we wanted high porosity for material to, to enter and adsorb onto that surface. Do you want to know what the surface areas of these adsorbents are? 
per gram. Okay, how many meters squared per gram? So you take one gram of adsorbent, how many meters squared of ad adsorbent capacity is it? A lot more than you think. Okay, so we're, we'll, we'll look at some of those numbers next. So let's take a look at some of these. There's a whole bunch of references to read. Uh, Almonds is extremely comprehensive if you're looking for one reference. Um, and then the CEDA reference is also pretty good. Now I just want to put this in context with the rest of the material you've learned and just talk a bit about why the course is structured the way it is. We've spent most of our time so far looking at continuous separation. So we started off the course with sedimentation, centrifuges, membranes, and then even liquid-liquid extraction we just covered now. All of those operate on a continuous basis. The next few separators we're going to look at are operating in a transient manner or in a batch manner. In fact, we've already looked at one filtration operates in a, in a batch manner, plate and frame, but not always, right? We can operate our filtrations like those rotating drum filters. They operate on a continuous basis. So filtration is one of those that, depending on how you engineer it, you can operate in a batch continuous. continuous. Adsorption is, is almost always batch, but I'll show you a few ways that people have tried to make quite clever changes to the system to make it continuous. We like continuous processes as possible. And then drying units we'll look at next as our next topic. So my goal with this section is just to show you what adsorbents look like, how they operate, um, how do we find the equilibrium isotherms for these adsorbents. So that's important for us is from our design perspective. We'll look at some basic sizing of an adsorption unit using some straightforward tools. They're very, very complex tools for sizing adsorbents if you go into the, the detailed health metrics. So how many of you are taking 4K? Okay. So you're looking at catalysts and you're looking at pores and material diffusing into pores. You're solving in the PDEs. Prashant kind of steering you away from PDEs. Yes. Okay, but if you go and solve them rigorously, you need to solve also the PDEs from mass and energy balance perspective. You'll see the same equations for 4K work here in adsorption. Okay, so we'll we'll look at some simple ways of sizing these units that don't require. Okay, let's take a look here. So absorption is a general engineering principle. And you guys have been mostly, up, the topics up here are, show a good understanding of what absorption is. We're taking solutes and we're selectively transferring them onto a solid or an insoluble particle that's suspended in a vessel. Okay, so like this material that you're passing around, that's your, your adsorb, adsorbent. And you're going to take your adsorbate and move it onto your adsorbent. And we're going to isolate that adsorbate in solute. Is there an ESA? We'll come on to that question later on. There is an ESA, in fact. But there is. So it's not an ESA. Let's cross that out. That's not generally true. There is an ESA involved. We'll talk about that later on, potentially. Um, the MSA always exists, that's this uh, adsorbent that you So the key here is adsorption is this molecule binds with the solid surface. And surfaces here is in red. Everything about this section refers to surfaces. And we're very, very interested in surfaces in this section. Anyone look at ion exchange in the topic for their course project? Yeah, one or two people. Um, so ion exchange. Same principle as adsorption, except the only difference is you're not binding your adsorbent to the surface. The <coughs> ion exchange does exactly what it says. You're replacing one ion on that solid surface with another. Okay, so for example, if we'd like to remove calcium from water, the so calcium is in the aqueous phase. Here's my ion exchange. There's a sodium over there combined with the rest of this polymer R, which is some big complex polymer. That's solid. What so ion exchange does is it say, takes the calcium out of solution, binds it onto the solid surface, and then frees up the sodium ion to go into solution. So calcium is hard, sodium is soft, so it's water softening. We're putting, exchanging the calcium in the water for the sodium instead. Chromatography, 
for those of you that work in the bio area, you've seen cr uh, chromatographs, or you've worked with them before in your labs, likely. Same principle of moving material through a packed bed, and then you've got the solution step. You're going to see that coming through in this topic. So we could cover all three of these, and most textbooks cover all three of these, but I choose to pick one, the principles and equations from adsorption apply equally well to ion exchange, and they apply equally well to chromatography. So if you study one, you've kind of got the principle for the other two as well. So as, as passed around here, you've got this first one, this charred wood pot. So what you're passing around is essentially coconut shell that they've charred up and created activated carbon or granular activated carbon. And that's used to improve the taste of water by taking out molecules that you pick up and your tongue is sensitive to, or your taste is sensitive to. It's also used to decolorize uh, liquids, uh, so any colors and pigments remaining after a process, we can clarify our liquid using an activated carbon or bone char. Um, those little white bags in electronics that we've mentioned already, ion exchange, and that's why we use in water software. So let's take a look then at uh, a few other examples of adsorption for gas. One of the most common uses are for removing water vapor and sulfur compounds from the gas stream. So we want to dehumidify or remove water from the vapor stream. I'll show you how that's done um, in the next slide. There's a very good adsorbent for that. Remove sulfur compounds, H2S, from a gas stream. Those are, are can poison downstream catalysts, so we want to remove H2S and remove CO2. So in the United States, a section of the International Space Station, they use adsorbents to remove carbon dioxide from the air so that the astronauts there, or whatever they hold, um, don't, don't, you don't build up CO2 in that atmosphere. So they have adsorbents to take out and remove CO2 from the vapor stream. We'll also use them and see them used in oxygen from nitrogen separation, uh, water removal from ethanol, and acetone. So this is a, a solvent, an organic solvent. Remove that from an airstream before you vent it out into the atmosphere. If you've got any residual acetone, say from a solvent extraction, so the, let's look at the previous topic, liquid-liquid extraction, you have may, may have used acetone as your solvent, and there's air streams passing over that as you pipe it around. Before you vent that air to the, to the atmosphere, you need to remove that acetone. And passing that air stream through a bed of adsorbent will remove that acetone for you. So this is all vapor phase. Um, we can also look at liquid-liquid separations. So you can pass liquid through that adsorbent. So like the breeder water filter is a liquid example. But um, other examples are removing sulfur compounds. And really interesting here is the use of adsorbents to separate out isomers. Okay, so isomers have very close boiling points, very close volatility, so we cannot use distillation to separate isomers out very often. Uh, they have very, very close physical properties, but what we can do is find an adsorbent that will selectively take one out over the other and then separate those two isomers from each other. And I'll talk about this example of gold and cyanide coming up. So very widely used. Let's take a look at the principle here. Um, so as mentioned, we're going to have our molecules attached to the surface of that adsorbent. And the main characteristic of that adsorbent is we want that adsorbent, not just the outer surface, to be available for, for, the, for the particles. We also want a very porous structure. So as Paul mentioned, we want high porosity so a very complex pore network through that solid so that our particles can diffuse inside the pores and attach inside the particle as well. The outer surface is only a very small area. The inner surface is actually a far greater area. So we'll talk, I'll come back at uh, tomorrow's class and we'll talk about various mechanisms in that class. So just to get, get an idea of the sizes we we're referring to here. So we're comfortable with what a meter looks like. We're comfortable with centimeters and millimeters. So going down that scale, then we have nanometers, 10 to the 9 nanometers, and 8 to the meter. 
Our most common unit that we'll deal with here is angstrom. So you're used to this from chemistry as well. You've looked at solids and the crystal structure of solids. You, you, you likely used angstrom in your chemistry courses. So a hydrogen atom or helium molecule is on the order of one angstrom in size. To give you that size range, pore sizes on these adsorbents. So this diameter of this sort of tubes through the adsorbents, they range in the order of magnitude from 10 to 200. Why is this important? We need to get an idea of if we have these pores, will the molecules that we're trying to adsorb even be able to move down this pipe and go through here? Okay, so what's the size of water vapor? How many angstroms is water vapor? Hydrogen and helium are about one angstrom. Water is Okay, so if these pores are 10, 10 angstroms in diameter, if there's a water molecule attached to one surface here, it's already taking up half the pore volume, and the other water molecules side by side, and then that blocks the pore off, preventing any further water from diffusing in. Okay, so you're starting to see why we need to understand what these diameters are. So we have to be able to calculate we want enough space for material to diffuse it, attached to the wall, attached to this wall, but still leave space for new material to come in afterwards and attach to the wall. Okay? So I'll talk about the pore, pore sizes and, and size of the molecules later on. Our other concern is not only the pore diameter, but also how much area is available. So typically these solids are between 30 to 85 percent open space. And the typical surface area is between 300 to 1,200 meters squared per gram. That's phenomenal surface area. Okay, if you consider that the size of a hockey field is about 5,000 meters squared. So four grams of some of the most adsorbing material would have that equivalent area. That's a lot of material that you can adsorb onto that surface. Okay, so. Let's take a look at, at what some of these, these look like. Here's one type, activated alumina. It's one of the most, most widely used adsorbent. It's got a fairly low surface area compared to some of the others. But still, like if you think about 300 meters squared, that's a substantial amount of surface area per gram. And there's the pore size range between 10 and 75. So this is. Uh, this is a, a cap of a screw cap of a sort of like a medicine size container, so it's probably about an inch or so in diameter. And there's those activated alumina spheres are made artificially. There's a lot of porous space in there for that material to diffuse in and attach to it. Activated carbon, like the one that was just passed around from the breeder water filter. Um, so we take coconut shells, nuts, wood, any sort of material of that nature and it's not partially oxidized to create that activation. And that material then can be extremely, um, have an extremely high surface area for adsorption. And pore size is between 10 and 50 extra. So if you look at it under, under SEM, that's what you would see. Then finally, one of the most widely used adsorbents, in fact, probably one of the most widely used adsorbents is a zeolite. So zeolites are very rigid structures. Uh, this diagram may, may mislead you. You may think that it's, these are one molecule of zeolite. This actually is replicated, right? So it's a, it's a rigid structure of these replicated left, right, top, bottom in all three dimensions. And you get this very rigid lattice structure occurring. And we have a cage on the inside, and that cage is got a certain shape, and then this entry to the cage is symmetrical from all, all sides. And this is the key reason why zeolites work so well, is that that cage has a very specific size that's constant for a given zeolite. So a very, very sharp, sharp diameter. Whereas with these others, we have pores that vary all over from 10 to 50 angstroms, well, there's a large range. With zeolites, there's one size with a very, very small tolerance. Okay? So these crystal structures in the, in the solid phase have very specific pore openings. And then we can use that 
to target various removals of separations. So if we're using this one for drying gases, that gives you a hint for the size of water. So what water's size is in the order of three angstroms. So water in the vapor phase, three angstroms in size, water vapor will enter that cage and, and get trapped in there essentially. CO2, this is the one that uh, is used in the space station. Air separation, this is oxygen from nitrogen. So nitrogen will enter, oxygen will stay out of that cage. So very, very specific um, zeolites size. So there's many of them that occur in nature. So washing powder has a lot of naturally occurring zeolites in it. So, what, so companies that make washing powder, they'll add zeolites that occur naturally that removes calcium from the solution and it improves the, the soap making ability of the washing powder. Uh, cat litter is another example of a naturally occurring zeolite, so the clumping cat litter is exactly that. Um, and then there's many others that have been synthetically created. So once you know the structure of zeolite, there's actually a mathematical relationship between the sodium, aluminum, oxygen, um, and silicon ions there. So there's you can change those ratios up and down and create synthetic zeolites. And there's whole books on it, so you can pick the zeolite that's got a known board size and find the one for it. Is the regular talk about removing water vapor, like a humidifier? Yeah, so it would be like a, like silica gel that was passed around here. That will absorb water for you, but you can it will also absorb all sorts of other things. Whereas this zeolite here, with that specific opening will take anything that's 2.9 and shrunk the smaller out. Now, it's not, uh, it's not just the size of that cage that's trapping, right? Because you, you can obviously imagine if water can get in, it can also get out again. So why, how is this zeolite actually removing water? Uh, so zeolites go by the name molecular sieves, <coughs> or mole sieves, as you sometimes see it abbreviated to. So these zeolites or molecular sieves, they'll take in a certain molecule, but that molecule can obviously, if it's gone in, can also escape again. Well, there's, once it's in there, there's also electrostatic forces in that cage that keep that molecule trapped. Okay? And it's not just when you take water molecule and look at its, at its size and calculate its, its size of angstroms, uh, we, we use what's called the kinetic diameter of the water molecule. So water molecule, that those, that those those molecules can shift and bend a little bit. So they can bend into that cage, and then the electrostatic forces keep them trapped in there. How do we remove those molecules once they're trapped? What might be one way that you can? So considering eliminating the charge, how else can you <coughs> sort of, we want to always recover our, our adsorbates afterwards. We don't just want to remove it, we also might want to recover it later on. Gosh. Uh, heat it? Heat it up. Okay. So by heating it up, you excite those molecules, you, they move around a lot more, and that molecule can escape again. So what's going to be really interesting in the next class is we're going to look at there's a temperature dependence. We're going to adsorb at a certain temperature, and if we want to desorb, we're going to elevate the temperature to get that molecule moved off again. And, and what we say, regenerate our heads all. So again, the silica gel, that one that's passed around, if you take that and you can, you can put droplets of water on it, but if you go heat that up again, that water will dissolve off it, and you can recycle it and reuse it. Okay, so what's interesting is uh, you can use helium and, high, and mercury porosimetry to determine the cumulative pore volume. And what's the main main reason that I want you to show this diagram is that it's not so much the technology that's used to calculate it, but to recognize that activated carbon, silica gel, activated aluminum, all of these materials have a range of pore diameters where zeolite you come up and all the adsorption occurs at a very single pore, pore diameter. It's a very, very specific size. And then these zeolites are named according to their pore sizes. So zeolite 5A, 3X, 3A. There's various naming conventions for zeolites that reference those, those cage sizes. 
And then, um, well, maybe I'll, I'll stop there because there's only two minutes left. And we'll continue with this example in the next class to illustrate absorption. And we'll look at some of the kinetics of it.